Welcome to Murfreesboro Storytellers. Our program this month is originating from Hopgood Explorer School, Baird Lane and Mercury Boulevard in Murfreesboro. And we have two very special guests, two astronauts who live in Murfreesboro, and I'm delighted to have them as a guest. Thank you, Dr. John. Ray Seddon, welcome. Thank you, John. Good, Good to, to have you. Thanks. And Robert, better known as Hoot Gibson, husband and wife and living right here in Murfreesboro. Great to be here. How did you two happen to get into the program? How did, did you always want to be an astronaut, Ray? Um, you know, I can remember growing up in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and going out in the backyard and watching Sputnik go over, okay. and knew that that was the beginning of the space age. Okay. And I thought, maybe someday I'd, I'd like to do that, because we all thought when we began flying in space that within 10 or 15 years, we'd be living in space. So, not quite yet. Not quite yet. Way, okay. And who, how about you? I, I didn't grow up wanting to be an astronaut. I, I was very interested in watching it, but I was always an airplane person. Okay. My mom and dad were both pilots, and dad was an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot, so I knew from the time I was about 10 years old, probably a lot of hero worship of dad, that I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot. All right. So I was an airplane person, and I didn't get interested in doing that space thing until I saw the first artist concept of a space shuttle, which was a hypersonic airplane mm -hmm. that was going to glide back in and land on a runway. And at that point, I said, I need to do that. Okay. And you are a fighter pilot, have been a fighter pilot as well, correct? Yes. I was a, a Navy fighter Navy pilot, fighter pilot. Um, flew two different types of fighters in the Navy, and uh, was also a Navy test pilot. And then flew, after being an astronaut, you flew with Southwest Airlines, I believe. Yes. I, after Ray and I spent 18 years with NASA, and okay. I wasn't tired of flying yet, so when we left NASA, I went to work as a pilot for Southwest Airlines. Okay. And what, what do you do now in the way of aviation? Well, nowadays, I work as an expert witness in aviation lawsuits, mm -hmm. and so I'm still having to do flight testing all the time. Uh, to go see why a particular incident or accident happened, what could have happened with the airplane, why did this accident happen. So I'm still doing flight testing. Okay. Uh, I still race in the Reno Air Races every September, uh, which is a whole lot of fun. Oh, I can imagine. And Ray, as you mentioned, growing up in Murfreesboro, tell us about your educational background. Uh, grew up here in Murfreesboro. My mother's family had been here for several generations. Uh, and she in, encouraged my father to come back after they married, after the war. Um, and um, I went to St. Rose okay. Elementary, which was a three-room, eight-grade schoolhouse at the time, very small. Then went to Central, graduated in the class of 1965, and then um, decided to go away to college. And I ended up at the University of California at Berkeley, okay. which was kind of a crazy place in the late 60s. Oh, I remember Berkeley those uh, days. Huh? And then came back to Tennessee for medical school and my residency uh, in Memphis. All right. Once you decide to enter the astronaut program, what kind of a qualifications do you have to, what kind of processing do you go through before you're ready to, to, to fly, if you will? I'll talk about it from the mission specialist standpoint, right. because they, when the shuttle uh, was designed, they decided to take both mission specialists and pilot uh, astronauts, right. and I qualified as a mission specialist. And uh, there was a selection process. We had to have a, a background, at least a bachelor's, and preferably an advanced degree in science, math, or engineering. And we had to be able to pass the physical exam, and we went through psychological testing in an interview, and that sort of stuff. And the, the pilots did something very similar, but I'll let Hoot talk about that a little bit. Well, well yes, the, the, we went through the same testing and the same uh, evaluations, when you came down for your interview in Houston, you got to talk to two psychiatrists, mm -hmm. which I had not had to be <laughs> shrunk prior to that. But anyway, talked to two psychiatrists and did all the physical testing. The pilots had to have at least a bachelor's degree in engineering science or math, mm -hmm. uh, and 1,500 hours of high-performance jet, which means jet fighter, basically. Okay. Um, and we had we never did pick a space shuttle pilot who wasn't also a military test pilot. Okay, all right. So when we, after we were selected, and it was, uh, there were a lot of people who applied when we did, about what, 11,000, something like 11, that? 11,500. 
uh, people that applied when we did, and they took 35 of us in wow. the first space shuttle class. Yeah. Then we went through uh, a good bit of training. The pilots taught us how to fly in the backseat of the NASA jets. So those of us who had only flown Cessnas or, or no other flying mm -hmm. suddenly found ourselves in the backseat of uh, high, high performance jets. And um, we had a lot of um, science uh, training. We wanted to be able to take care of whatever flew on the shuttle and, and look at the Earth uh, with some knowledge. We had, to, um, we had to learn about the history of space flight. We had to learn about the space shuttle and all its systems. Mm -hmm. And um, so there was a good bit of training. It was supposed to have been a two-year training uh, process, and they decided after a year that they needed us to work on the shuttle, which was about to fly. Okay. Anything I missed? No, so we were originally going to be astronaut candidates for two years. Okay. And at the end of one year, what Ray was referring to, at the end of one year, they said, okay, that's enough of this stuff. <laughs> uh, you guys have shown us enough at this point, so you're now astronauts. Okay. Now, there was, a, there was a big difference, though, in astronauts. There was a flown astronaut who had, already, who had actually gone to space, and then there was us, <laughs> unflown astronauts. Enough, yeah. And we got an astronaut pin at the end of our one year, uh, but it was a silver pin, and you would not get your gold pin until you flew your first mission. And became a real a astronaut. A real astronaut, okay. <laughs> so who, you had five missions, and Ray, you had three, correct? That's right. Different ships, di different? Yes, I flew uh, my first flight on Discovery, and my second and third on Columbia. And I flew Challenger on my first launch, All right. Columbia on my second one, Atlantis on my third one, Endeavour on my fourth oh, wow. one, and Atlantis again on my fifth one. Total time in space for each of you? I had a total of uh, 30 days in space. 36 and a half days in space. And there and was a time when I had a few more okay. days than he did, but uh, he made another flight and caught up with me. I, I can't help but ask you, what is it like to be up there and see the Earth down below? It must be a thrilling experience. It is uh, incredible. It's just incredible. I think word. I think you are taken by the magnificence of mm -hmm. the Earth, the magnificence of the stars in the sky. Um, if you're a religious person, it, it becomes a religious experience, uh, looking at God's creation, oh. and um, it's very interesting what you can see and what you can't see. Mm -hmm. Well, and the whole experience, you know, not only is the view spectacular, but you can fly. You don't walk anywhere when you're in space. You're weightless, yes. and so you're floating, you're flying everywhere you go. So you don't climb up the stairs to go to the upper deck on the space shuttle. You fly up the stairs, and you fly down the steps, and you fly down the tunnel back to the space lab. And while you're flying through the tunnel, you can be doing aileron rolls if you feel Cork like it. So, so not only is it this just spectacular view of the universe, mm -hmm. but you get to fly and float and be free like you've never been free before. Talk about what you do during those days you're in space. I'm sure you're busy pretty well all the time. We are. We have a, a very tight schedule mm -hmm. that's programmed out uh, in advance. We do a lot of training. Uh, usually there's at least a year of training for a specific flight for the Space Lab science flights, right. two years or more, and so everything is pretty much programmed. Um, and on my flights it was primarily science. My first flight we launched a couple of satellites, but then we did some, some scientific experiments. On my second two flights it was all life sciences research, trying to understand what happens uh, to humans and other living things like jellyfish and, and rats. Uh, when they go into space, how do they adapt to weightlessness? Right. How does gravity affect you that when gravity goes away, what can, differences can you see? And then how do you readapt? Do you have mm -hmm. to go through a readaptation when you come back from space? And all of those uh, experiments are proposed by scientists from all over the world, and NASA selects the best of them. So my role primarily was as a scientist, which was what I wanted to okay. do. Well, we have, we have a flight plan that's made out where basically every minute of the day is blocked out. And we would have a 16-hour work day and then an eight-hour sleep period. And usually you didn't sleep eight hours. It's too exciting to be there. And there were usually things that you had to wrap up. But the way it would start out was at your wake-up time, you had three hours of time 
which was mostly devoted to getting the vehicle w awakened or cleaned up or maintained or doing some of the things we had to do, aligning something called our inertial platforms and things like that. And then we had a whole work day and then the final three hours out of that 16 hours was the same sort of thing. It was uh, what they called pre-sleep mm -hmm. and the, the earlier one was post-sleep in the morning, but it was vehicle maintenance and the same sorts of things. And then in the middle part of the day, you had that block of time. And like I say, every minute and every activity that you were going to do was detailed in terms of who was doing it and who mm -hmm. was doing what. So you could open up the book and look at a particular day and say, this is what I did on day six mm -hmm. or what I will do on mm -hmm. day six. Any trouble getting to sleep? You mentioned about sleeping. You know, a lot of kids ask, how do you yeah. sleep how in space? Because uh -huh. they can envision getting in bed and pulling the, the blanket up and having it float away or having you float <laughs> off the bed. We have sleeping bags, and it has a hole for your head and a hole for your arms. They're anchored then. Huh? You can hook them to the wall anywhere you want. Oh, okay. You can sleep on the ceiling, the floor, the, you know, near a window, not near a window. Uh, and um, it's very comfortable to sleep that way. I think at first, um, you're a little excited about being there, and there's a lot of noise, so sometimes it's it's hard to sleep, but uh, you get used to that, and um, so it's pretty restful. What was the longest time you were up on any mission? The longest period of time? 14 days. 14 days. Mm -hmm. How about you? 10 days. 10 days, okay. Mm -hmm. What about eating your food? <clears throat> well, they try to make mm -hmm. the food um, like you might take on a camping trip. You know, people okay. think that we still squeeze stuff out of a toothpaste tube. That was kind of a, a low residue diet that they had uh, on the early space flights because they didn't have a very good toilet. Okay. Uh, but for us, they wanted to keep us uh, in good nutritional balance, especially if we were doing tests on ourselves sure. um, to, to look at adaptation. They didn't <clears> want <throat> us to be starving. But we took things like uh, uh, the meals ready to eat that the military takes. We mm -hmm. took dehydrated foods. Not sea rations, though. No, not sea no. rations. <laughs> okay, rations. Uh, we, we could take some uh, fresh food for early in the flight. Oh, could you? Okay. Jar of peanut butter, mm -hmm. tortillas, so we could play Frisbee with, okay. M&M's, so we could throw at each other. What else? A lot, of the, a lot of the food, the majority of it was the dehydrated food okay. that Ray mentioned. And there was a very good reason for using dehydrated food, and that was that aboard the space shuttle, the way we generated electricity was through three fuel cells. And a fuel cell takes hydrogen in one end, so we carried big um, liquid hydrogen doers and big liquid oxygen doers mm -hmm. as well. And so we'd feed hydrogen in one end, oxygen in the other end. That would generate electricity and the byproduct is water. So we'd carry dehydrated food because that all weighs less, and then we'd mix it with the water that we make every day up on orbit. Any revelations or discoveries that you were surprised at in, in, in doing your work? Anything unusual that you weren't expecting? Well, you know, for me, um, doing the life sciences experiments, mm -hmm. especially on the crew people that were on board. Um, By the way, how many in your crew typically? Well, usually seven. Seven, seven. Well, I flew two missions where there were just five of us. Okay. okay. So, but the science missions sure. usually had uh, four people working in the lab and three people taking care of the vehicle itself mm -hmm. or doing the other uh, operations. Uh, for life sciences, I think one of the big questions uh, always was, do women and men adapt to space differently? You know, one better than the other. And so on both my science flights, uh, the subjects were two men and two women mm -hmm. on each flight. So we could compare the, the information on the same flight and on many different systems. And it turns out that women adapt in the same way and readapt in the same way. Okay. So that wasn't ter terribly surprising to many people, but it had to be proven before we could actually say that. You gave you confirmation anyway. Yes. Okay. All you? Right. Well, I guess maybe, maybe not necessarily revelations, but with the space shuttle, we found that we could do things that we never imagined that we could possibly do. Right. And what I'm referring to there was that we rendezvoused with and repaired satellites. That had obviously never been done before. We rescued satellites. We had two satellites that launched in early 1984 out of the space shuttle, mm -hmm. and their booster rockets malfunctioned. So they were stu stranded mm -hmm. in a useless orbit. And a flight went up later that year and recovered those two satellites, brought them back down to Earth, 
and they were refurbished and they went back to space. My word. So, and for example, all the repair missions and the servicing missions that we did on the Hubble Space Telescope never could have been done without something like a space shuttle. So those were things that we learned to do and developed the capabilities to do that had never been done before. And to do those repairs, did you go outside the, the, the space shuttle? It would always, walk, yes, it would always in involve spacewalks. Now the pilots didn't get to do any spacewalks because I said we were too valuable <laughs> to send us outside, but we had plenty of mission specialists, so we could lose a couple of them if we, no, not really, but um, the mission specialists would do all the spacewalks, okay. so all the repairs, all the things we did on Hubble Space Telescope, all the upgrades, all the satellite rescues always involved a couple crew members going right. outside. So oh. neither of you actually did a space walk. Yeah. That's I was like, too small to fit in the suits, quite frankly. They found that out after we got there. Tell them a little bit, because I think it was revelatory, was working with the Russians. Oh, yes, please. Well, yeah, my final mission, um, I was the commander of the first docking flight that a space shuttle ever made. Okay. So over the course of 14 years of flying the space shuttles, uh, we had rescued satellites, repaired satellites. We had never docked a space mm -hmm. shuttle to anything. We would fly up close to a satellite, reach over with the robot arm and grab it, or send a crew member outside to grab it and then hook it to the arm. Uh, so I got to dock the space shuttle Atlantis to the Russian space station Mir. And that was a real, oh golly, pathfinding mission, I, I will say, uh, because we had to work with Moscow, mission control mm -hmm. in Moscow. We had to work with the Russians in their vehicle uh, we had to coordinate the two mission control centers, and coordinate the crews. We had to have checklists that were written both in Russian I was and in English. About the two languages. They had to be in both languages. And I had to attempt to learn to speak Russian oh uh, because the two Russians that I launched with, I mentioned that I picked up three Russians from the Russian space station and brought them home but I had to carry a replacement crew up to the space station. So I had two Russians that launched with me. They couldn't speak English, and they had a hard time affording English teachers or English textbooks. So we had to try to learn to speak Russian. And most of us were engineers um, and mathematicians mm -hmm. and things like that, and not language people. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of an effort. I can imagine, can you still speak some Russian? I said, yes, of course. I speak Russian very badly. Okay. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. But, but it was amazing <clears throat> to think that here we had American fighter pilots uh, doing cooperative work with Russian fighter pilots in space. Well, that, that was one of the big moments, I guess, of my whole spaceflight career I was when I docked with the Mir space station. The protocol was the two commanders would shake hands. So I opened the hatch and I shook hands with Colonel Vladimir Dzhurov, who right. had been a Russian fighter pilot, a Russian MiG fighter pilot, training to shoot me down all the years that mm -hmm. I trained to shoot him down. And the President of the United States went on television that night and announced that this handshake marked the end of the Cold War. So I tell everyone <laughs> I'm the one who ended the Cold <laughs> War. <laughs> That's great. Oh, what, what, what a great experience. Would you do it all over again? Absolutely. Mm. You know, the flying in space was, uh, it, it was such an opportunity, mm -hmm. especially to be one of the first women sure. uh, that flew in space. The view, the work we did, and I think um, most of all the people we worked with because they all answered that call right after Sputnik um, that we had to get better about flying in space mm. and, um, you know, here we were doing that, and uh, the people we worked with were wonderful. I, I can imagine. I'm sure you still have a lot of friendships and we relationships do. developed over the years. Absolutely. Many other towns that have two astronauts living in them? There are a few. A few. There's a couple. We, we <clears throat> just had two astronauts and their daughter down visiting us uh, last week uh, who live in Columbia, Missouri, and uh, Steve was in our class, was in our astronaut class, and his wife Linda was in one of the later classes. So, yeah, there are, there are some other couples out there. We went out to dinner at a restaurant and, and we told the waiter that he had four astronauts sitting at his table and he made us write our names down oh. so he could oh, check one. on Google oh, to make was... sure we were for real. <laughs> oh, what an experience for the wait on four astronauts. <laughs> Absolutely. That's that marvelous. Any uh, 
trying times that you had on any of your missions that, that caused you some real serious concern? Well, you know, the, the, the real big trying time we had was Challenger, was okay. the Challenger accident. Right. And maybe to put it in perspective, we had just finished 1985, where we flew, I think, seven or eight missions in that year. Mm -hmm. We had just received our fourth space shuttle, Space Shuttle Atlantis had just joined the fleet. So we had our whole entire fleet. We were looking forward to a real big year in 1986. Sure. And then we lost Challenger right. the end of January. And we didn't fly again for almost three years. But worse than being grounded, we lost seven good friends, seven dear sure. friends. Oh, yes. and went from being on top of the world to being in a great big deep dark hole mm -hmm. uh, in the three years that it took us to recover. Absolutely. I'm not sure what's going on <clears throat> exactly in NASA and as far as space travel and mm -hmm. space experimentation. What is happening these days? Well, I think people don't realize we still have a, the International Space Station up there All right. with a crew up doing uh, scientific work, uh, observations, um, and we are, I'll let Hoot talk about the development of a future rocket. Mm -hmm. Well, so so we have Americans in space 365 days a year. Uh, now, unfortunately, they're riding up and down with the Russians, so they all have to learn to speak Russian too. <laughs> but they're riding up and down with the Russians uh, because we've retired the space shuttles, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, we canceled the follow-on project several years ago. And then three years later, we finally started almost exactly the same thing. So we are going to have our own vehicle, but we have this hiatus of, uh, it's probably going to be six or seven years where we don't have our own vehicle, mm -hmm. and we have to pay the Russians a lot of money to take our astronauts up there. But the follow-on vehicle is in development. It's something called SLS, Space Launch System. It's going to be a big rocket that would let us go to the moon, let us go to Mars, mm -hmm. perhaps more importantly, intercept an asteroid because I've got to say that today, if we look on our radar screen and we see an asteroid and it's going to hit us in a year, it's going to hit us. Mm -hmm. We have no way to stop it, mm -hmm. no way to deflect okay. it, no way to turn it around. And this new rocket would give us a way to get it there. It would, okay. Very good. Hopefully. I would, I would hope <laughs> Big so. Big project. Yeah. Ray, you mentioned in our earlier conversation about payloads that you took up for, I guess, industrial concerns. We for did, for revenue. commercial uh, companies commercial and for the company. military. Mm -hmm. That was before Challenger. Uh, I think the idea was that we would take up commercial payloads and that they would pay at least part of the the, the uh, cost okay. of flying the shuttle. And then we'd have this all this capability after we had launched them, we would have the rest of the mission to do NASA work. But I think after Challenger, we decided that NASA should be a research and development organization. And so we began our focus back to that. Okay, so not any of that going on these days then with I, I think it's mostly military and, and, and um, scientific payloads okay. rather than commercial. Yeah, there, there, there is some capability on space station for a company to buy what they call a rack or a half rack and, and they can get some materials processing, for example, uh, that they can do in orbit because we, we made uh, latex microspheres, for example, in the past. We, we made different alloys of metal in the past, and that's that's something you could still do. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about young people who might be interested in what you've done or what you're doing or, or aviation in general? What would, what would you suggest, what would you recommend to them? First, get as much education as you can, preferably in something that's applicable. But you know, there are all kinds of ways to get involved in the mm -hmm. space, in space program, uh, even if you don't fly. There are, are many people that are building uh, for uh, commercial companies, uh, the rockets that are now being able to go up and as a, a, a paid uh, deliver truck, delivery truck to the space station. Okay. Um, there are people that work in at NASA in human resources. There are people that work in in you know what are the inside of of uh, rocket or space okay. vehicles ought to look like. Many different ways, but education is the key you have to have at least a college degree in something that's applicable sure. to space. Well, and I, I would have young people ask me all the time, hey, if I want to be an astronaut, yeah. should I be an astronomer? Should I be an astrophysicist? Should I be? No. What you should do is you should follow your passion. You okay. should find something that you really enjoy, and that's what you should do, because the kind of people we select to be astronauts were people that were very successful in their field. 
Therefore, they had to love what they were doing because mm -hmm. then you put your heart and soul into it. Therefore, you do well in it, and that's the kind of person okay. that we would pick. Absolutely. Excellent advice. Yeah. And people that are well-rounded. Mm -hmm. You find that astronauts are musicians or skydivers or uh, many different things. So not only focused on your education, but have a, a broad range of interests uh, that you pursue also. I know we mentioned you have many friends who are astronauts and still stay in contact. Yes. Is it, is it sort of a, a, an informal uh, society or organization of the former astronauts? There's a formal society, the, uh, right. a, the Association of Space Explorers, okay. that some people belong to, but, but we have reunions at NASA and uh, we frequently go down, uh, well, we're invited down every year for our physical exam to see if there are any long-term effects. So we get to see some of the people who are still in Houston. So our paths cross quite a bit. Every, every two years, there's a reunion back in Houston. Okay. And, uh, and those are a lot of fun because you see I'm people sure. you haven't seen for two years. Yeah. Tell us about your relationship with NASA in regard to Huntsville. Well, uh, of course, NASA uh, Huntsville, the mm -hmm. NASA Center at Marshall Space Flight Center, um, has in the in the past been in charge of booster rockets okay. and and the propulsion systems uh, for the for the space shuttle and for other rockets and also the space lab which was the uh, the canister uh, and the integration and all of the systems that uh, went together with that but Tell us other about things this space camp host. well space camp is part of the visitor center basically okay. at uh, at Marshall although it's physically separated from it from the Marshall Space Flight Center, and it's actually called the United States Space and Rocket Center, and Space Camp is part of that as well as a big museum uh, that's part of it as well. And that's a lot of fun for me. I'm down there at least once a month in the summer uh, speaking to the trainees and also speaking at graduations on Friday. Every Friday there's, there's three graduations, lunch with an astronaut, uh, family camp, and all of those things, so that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you for both for still continuing to be involved. Thank you for what you have contributed to the space program in the United States, and thank you for being a part of this great community. Dr. Ray Seddon and Robert Hoot Gibson, our two astronauts from Murfreesboro. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Thanks.